Welcome into Training Camp Live. Casey Phillips here with senior writer and editor Scott Smith, and it is day four? It doesn't matter. It, it's so true. <laughs> you get past day one, and it's all a blur. It's but we are here. Seven. It, yeah, day 7,000 of training camp already here, and we are here live with you every day the practice is open. We're giving you as many live looks into practice as we can. We're going to be taking some of your Facebook questions in the final segment. So if you have a question for us, put it in the comment section of the live Facebook video. We'll get to those in a little bit. We'll talk about all the major topics. And, of course, we always love starting with our Ticketmaster play of the day. This is from yesterday's practice, and I was so excited that this was the play that we were going to show. Cyril Grayson here. Look at this bomb. Great catch by him, and again, you get a you get a reminder of his of his jets. We talk about Scotty Miller all the time yeah. for that. Cyril's the one that actually was a, a sprinter, yeah. and you you can forget sometimes the speed we have in yeah. the wide receiver yeah, group. Yeah, Tom Brady had to make sure he didn't underthrow him on that one. Um, it, it actually was a little bit more impressive live. That look, you can't quite get the feeling of the distance of that throw. That was like a 50-yard throw mm -hmm. in the air. That was a bomb. Yeah, that and, was incredible. You know, <clears throat> I don't know. They don't get too excited about plays here in, in practice too much, but Tom Brady was turning around and high-fiving everybody after that one. So When Tom Brady, who's had a few good plays in his <laughs> life that matter a little more than a training sure. camp one, is that excited, you know it was yeah. a good play, which is great. All right, well, let's get ahead in here to Robert Hainsey. He spoke to the media yesterday. This is a guy that I think, you know, he's not necessarily round one pick. He's he's the guy that maybe hasn't gotten as much attention because we already know pretty much who the starters are on right, the offensive sure. line. But this is a guy that I think this team is very excited about and could potentially have a big role depending on what happens with the O-line this year. You never, you know, want injuries and right. knock on wood, but this could be a very important guy to this team. Yeah, well, the big role he would have, at least to start the season before, hopefully there aren't any, but before there are any injuries, is being a guy that is versatile enough to back up enough spots that he's ready to be the one to step in. So he's active on game days, and he's one play away from being in at one of any of a number of spots. And he's playing center right now. We were joking the other day about part of that was learning how to deal with the towel in the back of his, his pants that, that Brady wants there. Uh, but there are a lot more technical parts to learning that position, which he's never played before, by the way. And, and he was talking about them yesterday, and it does it, it is some things you don't think about. One of them, for instance, his feet are parallel when he starts. You know, if you, if you could picture an offensive tackle, which is what he played in Notre Dame, in your mind, they're usually staggered one way or the other, which is basically a half step towards where they're going to be going in the first place. So you're starting about a half step behind of where you're used to when you're playing center, and you have to snap the ball first. So there's a lot of things that make you have to move quicker, and I think that's part of the adjustment period. He was also talking about the fact that he's very good at movement plays, like if he has to pull, and you often do that with a center. So um, he, that's one of his strengths. He says he's not... The, be the biggest weight guy in the world. I think he meant lifting weights. Right. Um, but he's very good. He seems to have the weight part. <laughs> he's he's big okay. enough, yeah. right? <laughs> but, so, but he does have very good movement skills. So those are a couple things to think about when thinking about Robert Hainsey trying to make this transition. It's so true that those backup positions, the versatility is so important. And I think that a lot of times if, you've, if, you don't, if you've never played that position, it can be easy to just think it's all offensive Yeah, line. you're just going to block somebody. Yeah, right? yeah, and it, it really, it is so it's different. Not. I mean, I remember even when I had the show with Allie and Donovan, they <laughs> talked about just the same position but switching sides of the left tackle and right tackle that everybody assumes that's just so easy, but they brought up the idea of muscle memory. Sure. And that you do yeah. so many reps on that one side, your body gets completely used to that, having to switch to the other side. They said, you know, it's not quite as bad as trying to write with your non-dominant mm -hmm. hand or something, but right. it's, it's almost that same way where you have to retrain your body the other side. Well, how much more even from being staggered to then, to your point, well, that yeah. that straight on and having to throw that snap in there first, yeah. that's that's a tall it, order. And you're bent over as opposed mm -hmm. to standing up. So, you know, they talk all the time. Every offensive lineman has to keep their pads over their feet and they have to keep, keep from being too upright. And so he has to get in that position from a bent over position so that's just another thing that a center has to do that the other guys don't so there's yeah. a lot to learn there yeah and i mean the fact that he's getting thrown into these new positions in the nfl yeah <laughs> that you're already making the transition to the nfl and then you're learning new positions there I, and it shows how highly they think of him both in terms of his coachability willingness to learn willingness to do what's best for the team uh yeah just his ability to pick up new talents that, that it speaks very highly of what they think of him as a rookie yeah and think about how the, a lot of this draft was about the future mm -hmm. because the Bucks didn't have a lot of needs and could have that luxury. Now think about the fact that somewhere down the line, 
one of your five or two of your five or three of your five current offensive linemen aren't going to be here anymore. It's just a fact at right. some point, right? To have a guy that's like a chess piece where he could end up being your starting left guard, he could end up being your starting right tackle, just to have that means you got a lot more flexibility when building your roster in future seasons. And so now looking at um, – Pre-snap penalties, this is this is an area that I know Bruce harped on like crazy last year. And when we talk about some of the uh, turning points of the season, that this feels like one of those stats that is very important to the success this team had. As we talk about guys there like your offensive linemen, I mean, talking about a group that it is so important Oops. for that. And so tell us a little bit about what we learned about this from last year with okay, this team. Okay, so everybody remembers the Chicago game in week five. It was probably one of the most disappointing games of the season because we thought we were going to win it and then we didn't in the end. Um, but they have talked about that being a turning point for the team. And one of the reasons why was they decided on the flight afterwards that we can't have these penalties. Mm -hmm. There are just too many penalties, especially pre-snap penalties. So I looked it up yesterday, and I even was a little bit shocked at how stark it is. Look at this. Through the first five weeks, which included the Chicago games, 42 penalties committed by the Buccaneers, tied for the most in the NFL. For the rest of the season, that's 11 more games, more than double that, the original five. Exactly the same number of penalties, 42, which was easily the lowest in the NFL. From the most penalized team to the least penalized team, just because they decided on the flight back, we're not going to do this anymore. And then what it ended up being is the Bucks were the 11th fewest penalized team, which is pretty good. I mean, you want to be number one, but given where they start, it's pretty good. It is. <laughs> and so I think we should tell them to make some other decisions on planes right. moving forward, like like that we're going to win another Super we Bowl. We have to stop only throwing 400 yards per game. Yes, we need at least 500. <laughs> yeah, we need to tell you them. You went right to the Super Bowl one. I did. I yeah. went big. I'm like, man, if apparently whatever they decide on a plane happens, <laughs> like, let's go here. Let's make some big I, decisions. I, they should decide to give us big raises. Oh, that's yeah, another good one. Yeah, go. we needed to start whispering things into their <laughs> ear in the plane about what so, they needed to design. So also on that graphic at the bottom, you might not have caught it, was a little thing about Tristan Wirfs. Now, we know how awesome Tristan Wirfs was, was last year, but there's not a lot of stats for an offensive line. Yes. There is the one out there that by, I don't know, pro football focus or something, that he only allowed one sack during the regular season, which is awesome. But more quantifiable is penalties. And you would mm -hmm. expect a rookie starting every single snap at yes. right tackle against a bunch of great pass rushers is going to have some penalties. Well, he did. He had three. Three, and it's all incredible. of them were in the first five weeks. And then one of them it. was holding. The other two were false start. None the rest of the regular season. That's Unbelievable. incredible. The reason I bring this up is because yesterday, Coach was a little upset about the pre-snap penalties. It's like, Ooh, yep. and, and he brought up the Chicago game. He said, we fixed that last year. We made sure that we put that to bed. Those were the words he used. We can't let that rear its head again. Mm. We have to nip it in the bud right now. Yeah. And so there were some. There were too many of those yesterday in practice. And I guess one or two of them must have been Tristan because he brought up Tristan, said he had to chew him out a little bit. So obviously you'd rather have that occur out here yes. than in the game. And we love Tristan. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure he took that to heart. He's probably not going to make a lot of penalties, but um, that. He was brought up, but he has a good track record. I'm not doing. Yeah, so. I'm not. I'm not too concerned about him. But if he was able to limit that as a rookie with no off season, I'm yeah. pretty sure by his second year, <laughs> second year in this scheme and with Brady and all those things, that yeah, that's going to make a very big difference. Although it is interesting to think about the pre-snap penalties and especially in terms of things like false start where there were so many games that there weren't very many fans it will be interesting to see how that affects teams this year when you that's do true. have fans back in the stadium that's do true. you see an increase in some of those so i bet that's also part of why bruce is harping on it is they know that some of those factors are going to be more difficult for them this year than they were last year that you make a good point there but i would point out that among those first five games where they're getting a ton of penalties one was in new orleans which is one of the worst places for that to happen and one was at Soldier Field, which is usually a pretty loud place, too. So I don't know if that bears out in the stats, but it certainly makes total sense. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see now this year. You know they're going to have to harp on it even more. All right, well, we are going to show you some highlights from yesterday's practice in case you missed it. And then we'll come back here talking more about the team and getting to your Facebook Live questions. So send those in the comments section underneath our Facebook Live video. Check out yesterday's highlights.
Welcome back into Training Camp Live. Casey Phillips here with senior writer and editor Scott Smith. And as always, we are showing you live looks into practice. We are going to take your Facebook questions in the next segment, so leave those in the comment section underneath the Facebook Live video. And I know we talked a lot about uh, some of the DBs and specifically corners yesterday, but wanted to get a little bit more into Sean Murphy Bunting. That This is a guy who has had to play some different roles with the team. We've seen some uh, some ups and downs in, in some different games, but a lot of progress in, in recent games and, and years for him. What do you see as his role? and what he means to this defense? Well, his role is almost surely either going to be as the nickel corner, where he's very good, or as the nickel corner in nickel and in sub packages and as the outside, one of the two guys when there's only two on the outside, which is what we often refer to as the Rondé Barber role. It's hard to expect anybody. No to, pressure there. Right. <clears throat> I'm just saying the structure of the yes. role. We're not trying to compare anybody to Rondé Barber. But... Um, so it'll, it'll be a big role, even if it's just as the nickel corner and Jamel Dean is starting on the outside, which both of those things happened last year, that's still a very big job because you're in the nickel 55, 57, 60% of the time, depending on what team you're playing. So it's another starting job either way. Now, the thing about Sean is he's, he's never lacked confidence. You know that about him, right? Yes. Um, but he did. He had some ups and downs, which he acknowledged last year. And uh, I think... Even if he wasn't lacking in confidence, his production in the playoffs, when he became the first Buccaneer and one of the few players ever to have an interception in three straight playoff games, had to help, right? It, it was basically, I think the way he put it last yesterday was, it's showing how his, his work was paying off, right? Um, but all of those guys in the secondary, Sean included, <coughs> excuse me, are a little bit under the radar if you consider the fact that the Buccaneers are sort of now recognized as having a, a really good defense, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there's big names. There's Shaq Barrett, there's Levante David, there's Devin White, there's Ndamukong Sue. The guys in the secondary, they've given themselves a nickname, which helps, Gravediggers, but they're not the biggest names in right. the NFL. And Sean was talking about that yesterday. He says, we don't need to be the big. We've got big names on this defense right now. We can stay humble. We can be under the radar and just present ourselves as we want to present ourselves and you know the accolades will come right yeah and and let's talk a little bit about that nickel position in Todd Bowles defense and some of the things that Sean Murphy Bunting gets asked to do and just in the DBs overall what are the things that you have seen in terms of his scheme what do you think will be similar or different this year in the types of how attacking they are and asked to blitz versus asked to cover how aggressive is it going to be what have you seen of some of those ways that it has worked well for guys like Sean? Well, I think you to play nickel well in the NFL, you have to have a really good change of direction skills, right? You have to be able to operate well in traffic. You have to be a good, a good tackler because if you think about it, if you're in the if you're in the slot covering the, the slot guy, you're usually closer to the to where the offensive linemen are and where the running plays are going to happen. So if they if you're on the field in nickel and they run, you you got a much better chance than the outside corners of being involved in the tackle. So you need to be a good tackler. Again, to bring up an example, Rondé Barber, he was fantastic at that. And it helps, like Rondé was, if you're a good blitzer, too. And we have a couple DBs that are. That's another reason why they like the idea, occasionally, of Antoine Winfield, as an example, playing in the slot. He can do that, too. Um, if you're a good blitzer, you're a lot closer to the quarterback, the quarterback in the slot than the outside. So you're more often going to be blitzing than the outside guys. But just basically, you need, to be, you need to be good in traffic, and you need to be good at quick change of direction skills. I mean, you have to cover guys like Michael Thomas, who just run such good routes that it's, it's really hard to cover them, even if you're – if it's only like a three second route, it's hard to keep them covered at all. So that's, I think that's the challenge of playing in the slot and it's not an easy job. And that defense overall just took such massive strides last year. It was incredible to see what he did. And I know we have a graphic that talks a little bit about the defense as a whole. So I wanted to hear some of your thoughts on what were the biggest areas that you saw improvement in, what mattered the most to what this team was able to do. And, and do you see this continuing this year? Do you, yeah. Are some of these numbers potentially even going to go up? Well, that's another thing Sean was talking about. They want to be the number one ranked defense. And then he said, we want to be number one in rushing. We want to be number one in passing. I want to be number one in taking the ball away. And we're talking about the secondary right now. So the number that might jump out at you here is these are almost all top fives, except we were 21st in passing. But I think that's a little bit misleading. And I think a lot of coaches will tell you they don't care that much about the number of yards that a defense gives up or the number of passing yards. If you look at the bottom here, DVOA is a, a stat for on football outsiders that kind of consolidates a lot of thing and, and things and ranks defenses. And the Bucks were fifth overall in that category last year. And they were also fifth in passing, so it's it's a lot about a lot more than just yards. Right. So basically, these numbers are all really, really good, and I think they're a little bit better than what people thought. They, they were a little bit better, honestly, than what I thought they were going to be when I started yeah. calculating them yesterday. The, but this Bucks defense had a really good season last year, and I don't think it's quite recognized because 
the numbers weren't overwhelming. They weren't first in sacks. They weren't first in takeaways. But they were really high in almost all of them. So across the board, a very good defense. I think they're going to be quite a bit better this year. And, yeah, the passing yards is so interesting because there were definitely some games where the Bucks were up a lot on some teams. That happens. And then, yeah, they're going to they're gonna allow some of those. The teams are going to start trying to throw these big plays. They're going to be trying to come back. And it is very different than if you're in a lot of close games or you're behind or anything like that. Yeah, also, if you can't run the ball against us, you're going to throw the ball. Yeah. And you, for two years now, nobody can run the ball against yes, us. Yes, that is, that is a great point. What do you think the areas are going to be that we see – the most improvement in on the defense yeah, this year. It's not like the, the turnovers were lacking, the takeaways, I should say. I, I think we saw in that graphic we were fifth in takeaways, but I don't think they got as many as they wanted, and I don't. I think there were stretches of the season where we were not taking the ball away. And uh, in the playoffs, we really, really were taking the ball away, and it made such a big difference. If you, We don't have it here, but if you look at the numbers comparing the, the takeaways and then the points that the Bucks scored off of takeaways compared to the giveaways and the points we allowed off of giveaways, it's a huge gulf in the playoffs, and that was our defense at its peak. Now, we were playing awesome offenses, New Orleans, Green Bay, Kansas City. So the yards were happening, but the takeaways were happening, mm. and that's what kept those points down. I mean, nine points to the Chiefs, the number one offense in the Super Bowl, an incredible performance. I think that performance that you saw in the playoffs is what they're looking for throughout the regular season. So it has a lot to do with consistency, and it has a lot to do with some of your guys like Antoine Winfield, or Carlton Davis or Sean Murphy Bunting, who expect to create takeaways to create more takeaways this year. I think we always talk about every training camp, either the areas that you, you think a team wants to improve in or the areas that maybe there's now some concern in. And it's so interesting looking at this defense of what, what did they lose? You know, and is there is yeah. there any area for you that you would worry a little bit about something not being as good, or do we really feel like there's no reason for them to be anything at least as good or better? I don't see why you would look at this defense on paper and expect a decline in any particular area. Um, it's not really that old of a defense. There's some, there's some older guys up front. Levante David's in his ninth season, but none of these guys look like they're anywhere close to falling off the table. And, and if they don't, then why would they not produce the same as they, they did before? Um, I think one area that has a chance to be quite a bit better, though, is the edge rushing because mm -hmm. you could have a deeper rotation. If Shaq and JPP are just as good as they were last year and Joe Tryon is giving you something and Anthony Nelson takes a step forward, you have a deeper rotation and you have a better way to keep these guys fresh, your, your top pass rushers. So I think there's a possibility for it to be even better. And just a moment ago, um, our Alec had caught uh, Todd Bowles here on camera. We were mm -hmm. watching that, Todd talking to Bruce Arians. And just the fact that these guys are now will now be working with Todd for three years now, he could do so much more with them now that he knows what they know about what they're supposed to do. Yes, I would completely agree with that. And you know, it's funny with the edge rushers. I, Everybody's all worried about, oh, now that they've won the Super Bowl, are they gonna, is everybody going to relax? Is there going to be that same motivation, that whole chip on the shoulder, all of that stuff? I saw that JPP posted on Instagram that there was some ranking done about the top edge rushers in the league, yeah. and he and Shaq both weren't on that oh, list. I saw one where Shaq was on it, but yes, JPP the, was so not. depending on, well, no, there was one list that neither of them neither were on, was on crazy. it. crazy. And JPP had posted it. It was just like, okay, sure, like keep it's sleeping like what on they us. Did, give us that every year. Exactly. Last year was the secondary, exactly. right? Exactly. So that's what I was going to say. Thank you to these people doing <laughs> lists. I hope you continue to leave these guys off of it, yeah. because as long as that's the case, I don't think we have to worry about motivation, <laughs> yeah. as if they don't already want another Super Bowl, want this whole <laughs> thing. I mean, even just JPP in the, in the cafeteria earlier this morning, I saw him. We were talking about the ring ceremony, oh, and he was and yeah, he was he was dancing. I told him that him dancing and his speech was one of my favorite moments, and he just was like, "Yeah, I mean, well, let's let's do it again next year." Like, <laughs> just every single thing that guys are talking about, That's they good. all are constantly thinking about wanting to do it again. And so, yeah, for anybody that is worried about whether or not there is that There's motivation, no yeah, that is not a concern, not an issue. All right, well, we have another segment coming up after this. We're going to be getting to your Facebook <coughs> questions, so leave those in the comment section underneath our live video. That's how I'll be able to find them. We're going to take a quick break here and every day during this break we are introducing you guys to another one of our rookies and this is a guy that unfortunately we have not gotten to know as well on the field because of some injuries but we want to make sure you guys still get a chance to know Chris Wilcox. I feel like once I got the call it was just like it was a video going around like I think the NFL posted it and my dad was going all crazy and all that but once I was laying down like that night then it hit me for real. Just like, I just let it all soak in, but no, yeah, that night for sure. Yeah, so I ended up getting a DM from Sean Murphy Bunting. He just let me know he was excited to get to work with me, and uh, if I needed anything, just hit him up. From that message, I just knew like instantly that they were very welcoming, 
Uh, you know, I feel like they're really cool dudes in there and then we're just ready to work. I've been watching film on them and they look like their assignment sound and they know what they're doing out there. So I'm excited to get to work with them. I feel like the learning the plays and all that stuff is just a lot different than college for sure. Just the attention you get from all the fans and stuff like that. I think I had like 10K new Instagram followers. It was pretty crazy. So little things like that is just the difference for sure. Definitely my family. Just no one in my family has ever like come this far as far as football. Like we really weren't even a big football family. So I'm the first one in the league for my family. And I just know it's a lot of people out there uh, looking up to me and I don't want to let none of them down. And as well as my future family, I want to be able to provide for them. So definitely why I'm still going. And knowing they brought back all the starters, I knew it was going to take some time for me to get my respect around here. There's a very good team, but I still want to find a way to get on the field. Even if it's special teams, whatever I got to do, I'm pretty sure it'll be special teams this year, and hopefully I'll work my way up into the corner spot. You can expect a dog for sure, a hard worker that's going to give it 110% all the time. I just want to go out there and just show y'all that I can compete with anybody, whoever it is in front of me, I'm going to compete and I'm going to always give y'all everything I got. Welcome back into training camp live. Casey Phillips here with senior writer and editor Scott Smith. And as always, we take your fan questions here in our final segment. If you have one of those for us, leave it in the comment section underneath the Facebook live video. And our first one comes from David, and this is perfect. We talked about Robert Hainsey a lot earlier in the first segment. Do you think Robert Hainsey could be a starter next year? I'd probably have to get a look at the contract statuses, uh, but I think that we do have a couple guys that are up. I think maybe Ryan Jensen's going into his last year. Uh, Alex Kappa, I think, is going into the last year of his contract. So mm -hmm. it probably has to do with whether the Bucks can and want to bring a couple of those guys back whose contracts are coming up. Um, it's not out of the question, certainly. And, and that's like what I was saying before, that his versatility really gives you a lot of options there. If, let's just hypothetically say, two of the five starters were pending free agents and you thought you could only really re-sign one of them, you can really use Hainsey's versatility at, to help you decide which one you want to retain. So, yeah, it's possible. I, I don't, you know, don't necessarily want to predict that because I don't want to say I want any of our five guys. Well, right and now especially when we have not seen <clears throat> Hainsey get a chance to have any game action. I mean, who knows? It's well, one thing for, our, to, for us to just hear that the guys like him. Until we actually get to see him in some preseason games sure. and getting some action out there, I think it's very hard for yeah. us predi to but predict anything. The Bucks have done a pretty good job in recent years of, of uh, hitting on second and third round offensive linemen. Yes. Which, by the way, is not something that the team was particularly good on throughout most of its history. Hmm. So usually you got their their best offensive linemen either in the first round or just as free agents. Yeah. So. And I can't imagine <clears throat> that's something very many teams in general are good at. I mean, that's a that's a tough thing where you tend to hear that most of your sure thing offensive linemen not only go in the first round but they go quickly off yeah. the board oh sure if they're blue chip guys yeah they're, they're very popular in the top half of the first round but maybe what it is is the bucks have done a good job of scouting the smaller school guys mm -hmm. i mean it's ali marpet from hobart and alice kappa from humboldt state yeah i mean ryan jensen was a free agent but he's from like colorado state pueblo, pueblo yeah so uh, getting good scouting on those guys maybe helps you hit in the second and third Yeah, round. that's very true. All right, Daniel asked, are there any free agents that are turning heads? We always seem to find a diamond in the rough. Speaking of that good scouting of the lesser-known guys. Yeah, it's kind of, you don't have a whole lot to choose from this year, though. That's yeah. the problem with these types of questions. I mean, who do we got? You know what, I'll give you one. Yes, Nate Brooks. You may not even know necessarily who I'm talking about right there, but he's a cornerback. Uh, in May, after the draft, the Buccaneers signed two or three uh, veteran defensive backs, like Antonio Hamilton, who played for the Chiefs last year. And one of them was Nate Brooks, who doesn't have a ton of previous playing experience in the NFL. I think he's been with Miami and one other team. But he does have some, and he's been around for a few years. Yesterday, I personally saw him make three really nice pass breakups in three different uh, periods of practice. And then afterwards, one of the players, when asked about guys who were doing well, I think maybe it was Sean Murphy Bunting, brought up Nate Brooks and said he's just making plays every day. So... We've talked about the cornerback competition and, and trying to fill that fifth or maybe even sixth spot. He's a guy that maybe I wouldn't have put at the top of that list a couple days ago, but he's really working himself into the conversation. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, uh, I love this question um, because you are definitely going to be able to answer this. Uh, a different Daniel had asked, um, so the players have their numbers on their Super Bowl ring on the side. What takes that space if it's not a player? The NFL logo. Oh, okay. That's a very good question. Yeah, yes. I hadn't noticed that too. So I don't know if you know this, but I got one. Yeah, I, I hadn't I hadn't noticed that. I hadn't I hadn't seen that. And underneath Smith, 
which is really one of the neatest parts of it for me that it has my name on it, yeah. is the NFL logo. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and then right below it, Anthony had asked, did Casey get a ring too? Not yet, but I am getting one in a few weeks. All of the other business staff for the people who haven't been here for all eternity uh, are <laughs> getting you. our rings. <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself. Uh, are getting our rings in a few weeks in August uh, at some point. So yes, yeah, so I will very much be showing that off, I'm sure, awesome. as soon as we get it. So yeah, we'll have to have a show where both of us I want to rock see, them. Did you, did you see J, JPP's um, ring? No, I didn't. Because not. I wonder what it looks like with a really long name. Because like my, oh, right, I have the a Pierre five letter Paul. last name, and it's it just fits right in there. Yeah. So how do they make a name that long? Of course, also for I'm Gronkowski. sure his ring is probably even bigger than yours because well, his fingers even point. bigger than yours. <laughs> There's more space I there to work so. with, which is pretty <laughs> funny. Um, so, John had asked, "Whatever happened to Justin Evans, the safety we had?" Well, he was finally let go last year. Um, you know, it was really kind of a sad thing that with him because he showed a little promise in his first season and a half, and then he got that injury and the foot injury and just never could get back on the field. Um, I looked recently to see if he'd sign with anybody, and at least the last time I looked, he has not. Um, yeah, so we, we finally had released him um, after a couple of years, really, of him trying to come back from that injury. And that, unfortunately, that happens from time yeah, to time. Kendall so Beckwith comes to mind. Yep. And you, you really hope, and, and you work with the guys, and you, you really hope they can make it back with Every now and then a guy doesn't make it back from an injury. Yeah, that's so tough. Uh, we also had a question asking, what does our depth at safety look like? Well, it's not real good right now yeah. because um, Jordan Whitehead's on the COVID list, and um, we had to wave Curtis Riley, a guy we signed in the offseason due to an injury. And we also had, um, well, Anton Winfield missed two practices because he got a false positive, and so he, but he's back now. Uh, <coughs> and there's another guy, I'm blanking on it. I believe we have one other safety who's on a PUP list. So um, it's a little thinned out right now, and that's that's the reason that Ross Cockrell, who's a cornerback, is playing there. And yep, he's there again. You can see the safeties. We can see the safeties right here, uh, right behind us. Um, you know, you see Antoine Winfield's back there. Um, mm -hmm. And so and yesterday the starters were Anton Winfield and Mike Edwards, and then you see 43 right in the middle there. He is a uh, that's Ross Cockrell, and he was a corner, but he's been playing all throughout this camp at safety. And I think we talked about this before, but if anybody didn't hear it the last time. Um, they like the idea. He's a smart guy and a, and, and a versatile guy, and they like the even though he's basically just helping with numbers right now. They like the idea of him possibly proving that he could back up three or four spots on game day, and that can help you when you're trying to keep other guys active on your 47 or 48 man game day roster. Okay. Uh, and then David had asked, "What do you think about the outside linebacker rotation involving Joe Tryon? How much could he? How much action could he see?" Yeah. Well, he's probably going to determine that by how successful he is early in the season. If he's if he's coming in and the play, the level of play isn't dropping at all, or he's making big plays, they'll find more ways to put him on the field. And again, sometimes you could take a guy like JPP on passing downs and move him inside a little bit, and then you could have all three of them on the field at the same time. There's a lot of ways that Todd Bowles can work it. So, if if, if Joe Tryon looks good from the beginning of the season, I think you'll see a lot of them. Okay. And uh, Greg had asked, uh, has the roster number changed for game day? I think meaning how many guys you can have active yeah. and all of that the, um, no it's still the same and because uh, those rules last year um, involving being able to bring up practice squad guys for game day and being able to keep either 47 or 48 guys active you, you have to have eight offensive linemen active to have 48 but why not you know there's no harm in having if you can't that's a, that's mm -hmm. the only way you can get to 48 then do it right and so every team does essentially uh, I, there is no change to that and those were actually new rules in the CBA they weren't part of the kind of cobbled together in the last minute in July rules to help teams deal with COVID. Interesting. So that's still around. Now, the, the question mark, which still, as far as I'm aware, has not been decided, but it is believed to be, will they keep the rules that were COVID re related last year, like a 16 man practice squad mm. and the IR being you could come off as in as little as three weeks. <clears throat> I think they're going to keep those rules for this year. Okay, well, that's going to be interesting. All right, well, that is going to do it for us on this edition of Training Camp Live. I want to throw up this graphic to show you all the different days that we will be out here for practice. Tomorrow is the first off day that the players have of camp so far, so we will not be having a show, but then we'll be back out here on Friday, so we will see you guys then.